I'm sure that many of you noticed when you looked at the agenda before deciding to come to this beautiful conference um, that there's a like, very distinct focus on performance, right? And that's because um, I think it's like the elephant in the room that there's definitely some electron apps that use you know, more computing resources than they should. Um, and that there's also like, still this, this general idea that um, web apps have to be slow. Right? This is like a thing, they, they have to be slow. And I think this whole day has been in part about how can we first as developers build desktop applications that aren't slow, even if we use web technologies, but um, also about what is the future going to look like, right? How, where are we going to go from here when it comes to that? And um, uh, very deliberately, we put a big focus on WebAssembly because that's a very important piece. But many of you are here for Electron, right? Many of us build Electron applications for the desktop. Um, so I'm very excited that we convinced Deepti to come by, who's working on the WebAssembly team in Chrome, and therefore uh, one of the people who's like really, really important to us as Electron developers when it comes to us actually using WebAssembly. So with that, please give it up for Deepti from the Chrome team. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, Felix. Uh, I'm Deepthi. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I work on implementing WebAssembly features in V8, um, with some contributions to the WebAssembly standardization efforts as well. Uh, we've had a little bit of just talk of WebAssembly all of today. So we've heard from Lynn and Francesca about WASM performance and what the roadmap for the future looks like. Um, the main focus of this talk is going to be about V8 internals, but I'll also talk briefly about uh, what WASM bytecode looks like and how it's uh, generated. So um, let's get started with a very common usage pattern for WebAssembly. So say you're developing an app that may use some source code that's not JavaScript. Maybe you're using a library that's written in C or C++, like an image decoding library. Um, the next thing you would want to do is to use a compiler to compile this to WebAssembly bytecode uh, that also generates some JavaScript and HTML glue code and load the bytecode in a browser or other embedding and run it. So um, I, there are a couple of things that I want to point out here that uh, WebAssembly is not intent, excuse me, I didn't hear that coming. Uh, WebAssembly is not intended to be written by hand. Uh, it's designed to be an effective compilation target for uh, low level source languages like C, C++, Rust, and perhaps other languages in the future. Um, and also the other thing I want to point out is that if you have existing JavaScript code, there's a chance that JavaScript engines already do a really good job of optimizing this and the execution is fast. So uh, putting over existing JavaScript code to WebAssembly is not what the primary use case is here. Uh, WebAssembly is useful when uh, there's computation intensive code and uh, you want to run something that needs uh, predictable performance. So um, at a high level, this is what it looks like. So I'm taking C, C++ source code, um, and the code is compiled using a front-end compiler tool chain like Imscripten, and, uh, which by default will generate a JavaScript and WASM file. And if you pass in an optional command line to generate an HTML file, it will do that as, as well. Um, so Imscripten uses Clang to convert C, C++ to LLVM bitcode and FastCam to compile the code to JavaScript. Um, the output JavaScript can be, uh, you know, can be executed by Node.js in a Node app or uh, within HTML in a browser. Um, Imscripten was originally developed for Asm.js, so uh, which can be bundled inside a JavaScript file, uh, but when you have a .wasm file, uh, the binary file is on the side, so you will need more. You will need to distribute more than one file. Uh, the command line below is what I've used to compile a really simple program that adds two numbers to WebAssembly. So, when you have this .wasm file, what is inside the binary, uh, and what you know? How do we find out what's happening? So, you can use this uh, toolkit called WAPT, which is the WebAssembly binary dual toolkit to disassemble the .wasm file and find out what's happening. Um, it's also a little bit of a background and it's a fun word to say because it's, you could just say wabbit, and wabbit's <laughs> always a fun word to say. Uh, 
Um, so uh, when, when you disassemble this, I've, I've only pasted a snippet of the obj dump of this file. But uh, when, when you have like a C file that just adds two numbers, so if you look at this, it just says add two. You have two in 32 parameters, and you have a result which is also an in 32. And these parameters are represented as locals. Um, and that would be uh, the bytes, the WASM bytes you see when you disassemble something like this. There's also a lot more information in the binary file. So it has uh, metadata about the module, the version number, information about memory, uh, tables, the custom sections, number of sections, number of functions, etc. The functions are uh, kind of the more interesting parts of the code because that's what you would use to uh, you know, used to run. Uh, so the bytecode that is up on the screen there just represents the function body that corresponds to this. So the, the part below, the part to the left of the colon is just an index. So the actual bytes are just the opcode and the local index. So if you see right here, it's a, you can see what the, what the bytes actually represent. Um, and Compared to a textual format, that's really fewer bits over the wire, so you can see how uh, it gets some of its performance there. So what exactly is a module? A uh, module is an executable unit of code. Um, so WebAssembly programs are organized into uh, modules, and a module collects definitions for types, functions, tables, and globals. Uh, you can also declare imports and exports and provide initialization logic in the form of data segments or element, section, element segments or an optional start function. Um, and a module can be instantiated at runtime with a set of import values so that you produce an instance. Um, in the post MVP feature that that we, that's on the roadmap for WebAssembly is the integration of ES6 modules and WebAssembly modules. So um, I, just in the previous slide, I wanted to give you a pictorial representation of the module itself. Uh, so this, this, the middle portion is maybe the representation of the WebAssembly module. So you have a linear memory, which is a contiguous byte addressable uh, range of memory and uh, that you can basically, it's up from zero to memory size, and the memory size can be dynamically resized as well. A uh, table is similar to a linear memory, but the elements of the table are opaque values, uh, you know, of a particular table element type. The purpose of the tables is basically to implement indirect function calls in C and C++. Uh, you have some global variables there and some functions. A uh, global variable stores a single value of a fixed type. Uh, it can either be mutable or immutable, and uh, it gives the module some memory that's disjoint from the linear memory that's specified there. Um, you, again, like I said in the previous slide, you have some imports uh, that can be provided by the host environment at instantiation time. Uh, the exports are, uh, the module can declare a sequence of exports, and when it's instantiated, these exports are uh, uh, returned to the host environment. Um, and the thing I wanted to mention is also that you only have one linear memory and one table. They can either be defined in the module or they can be imported, but you can't have uh, both. Um, uh, and at one time, what you actually have is a WebAssembly instance, and it references all the state that's accessible to the running module. So um, we, let's, like, now we know what a module is, and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what happens in the engine. Um, so currently, the only way a WebAssembly module can get to the V8 engine is through the JavaScript API. Um, there's a proposal in progress for adding a C API for other embeddings, but you know that's still uh, not quite there yet. Uh, so what happens when a module gets to the V8 engine? The first thing that happens is it's decoded and it's validated. They mostly go hand in hand, but uh, validation checks that a WebAssembly module is well-formed, so only valid modules can be instantiated. 
Um, so when you have function code, you, there's a couple of different ways of compiling them. You have liftoff, which is the baseline compiler uh, for V8, uh, for WebAssembly V8, and Turbofan, which is the optimizing compiler. So uh, most of the functions are compiled using liftoff, and they directly generate machine code. Uh, these functions are also parallelly compiled on Turbofan, which is the optimizing compiler in the background. Uh, so Turbofan's design supports entering the pipeline very late. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, it's basically, you know, it bypasses a bunch of things we have to do for JavaScript code, uh, so it does have a faster path to uh, getting the functions compiled. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, liftoff. Uh, the goal of liftoff is to reduce startup time uh, for applications that use uh, WASM uh, by generating the code as fast as possible. So uh, the code quality here is secondary, as because hot code is eventually just uh, recompiled with Turbofan anyway. So what what we're trying to do here is to emit code as fast as possible. Um, it, it takes a fast path by avoiding the time and memory overhead of constructing the IR. Uh, it generates the, m the machine code in a single pass, and uh, in fact, the, when you have the function body decoder, it, it, like, it, it does a single pass over the raw WASM bytes, and uh, the, s the next stage, it actually interacts with a sequence of callbacks, so code generation is performed when decoding uh, and validating the function body itself. Um, and when you put this in conjunction with the streaming APIs for WebAssembly, this means that V8 is compiling WebAssembly code to machine code while downloading over the network. So um, let's contrast this with what happens uh, in V8 for JavaScript. Uh, so the process begins with a script text coming over the network uh, cache or ex an extension or an app. The script text is uh, processed by the parser, uh, which builds an abstract syntax tree. Um, then uh, the tree is then walked to generate the bytecode for uh, the interpreter, which is ignition. Uh, the bytecode is interpreted, and when the bytecode is running, there's more type feedback that's uh, collected. So uh, when a function is uh, you, when a function's been run enough and it is hot, the type feedback and the bytecode is used to feed the optimizing compiler, which is Turbofan, right there. Um, to, so this, the machine code that Turbofan finally generates is filled with assumptions about uh, type feedback that when you violate these assumptions, they trigger a deoptimization, uh, which kick things back to the interpreter. So um, this, this goes back to the thing I said about predictable performance earlier. The fact that uh, JavaScript can have these DOP paths, which are not always predictable. Uh, WebAssembly can sometimes guarantee predictable, I mean, WebAssembly can guarantee predictable performance because then no, it's statically typed, uh, it has structured control flow, and so there are no type feedbacks, no, assum no type feedback assumptions, and uh, no deoptimizations. Um, yeah, uh, and the, the assumption that we're building on here as well is that when you're compiling with the tool chain, uh, the language, the compiler, the front end compiler actually generates optimized bytecode for the WASM module, so you will have some optimization that you can still perform in the optimization compiler, but a lot of that should have been taken care of at the front end itself. So um, I've been talking about Turbofan uh, in, you know, f for a few slides now, so let's take a look at what Turbofan actually does. So Turbofan is the optimizing uh, compiler that was designed for JavaScript and Asm.js. Uh, JavaScript has some difficult to optimize features, like it, has, it doesn't have explicit types, uh, it has prototype-based look, property lookups, uh, it has some dynamic evaluation of code. Uh, what Turbofan does is uh, to generate the AST, to use the AST or uh, the bytecode to generate a graph-based intermediate representation. Um, the goal, the design goal of Turbofan is to achieve peak performance. Uh, so peak performance with a high quality of machine code. Uh, 
So um, there's so there's an example for like the simple ad example that we were talking about earlier in the presentation. So this is what it would look like in as a part of the turbofan graph. So um, the computations or the operations are represented by nodes, and uh, data flow, control flow, and dependencies are represented by edges. S uh, so for, for JavaScript, the graph actually goes through a series of different transformations. So we start with JavaScript operations. So when you have an A plus B in JavaScript, you start with uh, JavaScript operators. So when you have the JavaScript operators, the graph is reduced to uh, the intermediate or simplified operators, which express VM level operations like allocations, bounce checks. Um, and these are then reduced to machine operators that correspond really closely to instructions that will be emitted, uh, by, emitted at the back end for each platform. Um, but when the WASM compiler plugs in, I'm going to go back a slide. So when the WASM compiler plugs in, it's at turbofan level, but it's also uh, at the level when, when we put in operators for WebAssembly, what the WASM compiler does is it actually uses machine operators, so it skips uh, the type lowerings and other lowering passes that we uh, perform for JavaScript. So there's, uh, there's a little bit of uh, speed up of the pipeline there as well. Um, so now we do have a set of, you know, there's, there's uh, a turbofan graph. I talked a little bit about the optimizations, but there are uh, many different optimizations for top-down or bottom-up graph for transformations, inlining, uh, dead code elimination, et cetera. So uh, the nodes that are not reachable from the end, uh, including dead control or dead effects or uh, computation nodes, um, are eliminated. Like most, no, most phases never see dead code placed in the final schedule. Um, the output of all of these optimizations is a traditional control flow graph. Um, so once you have uh, the control flow graph, uh, what, what happens with, uh, sorry, when you, you, you first want to schedule the graph, obviously. The, uh, it has many possible CFGs, many possible assignments of nodes to CFG blocks. Uh, so what is the most efficient order and placement? So this depends on, like when you get the final CFG, it depends on uh, flow of control, loop nesting, what kind of register pressure you're under. So um, there are a lot of different things that go into uh, getting scheduling right. Um, with the CFG, uh, when you're trying to do instruction selection, the nodes in blocks are visited in reverse CFG order. Um, I'd like, I would have liked to go into this a little bit more, but it's a short presentation, so I'm not going to talk about that a lot more. Um, then uh, it, it, a lot of this is also uh, dependent on some sophisticated register allocation. So um, uh, Turbofan uses uh, a linear scan allocator with live range splitting to assign registers and insert spill code. So this is kind of uh, after code generation is when you get individual uh, machine code for different platforms. So this is, this is how you would get from WASM bytecode from the WASM compiler to machine operators to when from the machine operators, you would go directly to instruction selection, register allocation, and code generation. But this is basically what the whole path would look like for uh, JavaScript. So um, I, we've kind of jumped around a little bit, but I do want to talk about what um, our team is working on for the future. Uh, we, you know, we heard Lynn talk about all of the things that are on the roadmap for WebAssembly in general, uh, but from the Chrome side, uh, we, are, uh, we put in a lot of work into uh, pthreads, atomic operations uh, for WebAssembly, and we do have an origin trial, so if, uh, I, you know, if you have, if, you, if this is something you want to try, uh, please come back and talk to me, and I can show you how to maybe get in on the origin trial or enable that uh, with uh, the experimental threads flag to see uh, what happens. Uh, we this is all still in active development, so as much we're looking for active feedback. So if this is something you would like to try, please do. Um, we're also actively working on fix with SIMD. 
uh, fixed with SIMD is, is, is just there's, from an engine implementation, there's just so much volume to how many SIMD operations there are. Um, this, uh, as of last week, there's also like an end-to-end -end implementation that's working in Chrome, bar a few bugs. Again, if this is something that's interesting to you and you have use cases, uh, please come find me. I'd be really happy to talk to you. Um, we have some other teammates who are also working actively on exception handling, on garbage collection, on implementing tail calls. Um, there are others that are kind of maybe smaller proposals that have already been implemented, like sign extension operators, import export of mutable globals, uh, the JavaScript big into WebAssembly I64 integration as well. Uh, there's a lot of just exploratory conversations happening around host bindings and what that looks like for the future. So um, thank you for listening to me. Uh, these are some of the links that um, I've kind of gotten my material from are also a really good to look at for V8 internals, uh, general WebAssembly information, uh, or uh, there's a couple of code labs that I've linked there for uh, beginning for like a WebAssembly intro program, how do you compile it, and uh, a physics engine sample as well. So thank you. All right, that was really cool. I'm like extremely into the idea of like, just, sorry, I'm, just, AV told me specifically to stand right there. They were like, you can stand wherever you want, just not there, okay. I'm just really excited about like posting all of this to Hacker News and just telling them about what we're doing with web apps. Yeah. Just, you know, it's, it's gonna be fun for me. Um, any questions for DeepD? Ah, there we go. Um, could you just mention like what you think of as the like um, like I, I don't know like flag planting like the current people that use WebAssembly that are like sort of the like what you kind of think of when you're like building stuff like oh this this would be great for this project and you know, yeah kind of your um, ones? so one of the things that's actually been really fun is uh, we watched uh, Autodesk compile a 35 year old code base to WebAssembly and run it on the web so it's it's it kind of it's kind of one of those flagship they have a really old code base that's been sitting around. You, you could compile it. I, I mean, there's obviously a lot of, like, they worked with us to figure out some of the issues. It's not fairly straightforward all of the time. Like, it, the compilation happens, but just to kind of, you know, figure out how it interacts with the host, with the, what web APIs make sense, that kind of a thing. So it was, I, I mean, I think the feedback we got from them was uh, they were surprised by how easy it actually was, despite the problems that we had, which I think is a pretty flagship just take this native code base, compile it uh, to C++, and it's available on the web. Um, there are obviously game engines are always the early adopters of something like this. They're you know, multi-threaded code bases, they want performance, they, uh, you know, these are things that they would like to do. So Unity, Epic, uh, we're working with them to make that happen as well. Are there any plans for like runtime information being consumed in the optimizing compiler for WebAssembly? Um, so I think that the, uh, I, I w the short answer for that is not right now. Um, mostly not because we, I, I think we experimented with just eager tearing up versus runtime feedback and you know whether there's actually any benefit in doing that. But because it's it's static types, there's you know the information is usually like if, we, if we're able to compile both of them in the background, um, I think the eager tearing up has given us more benefit than uh, actually collecting type feedback. Uh, but again, that answer is for right now. We're still uh, liftoff is pretty new, and we're still kind of doing some more work on tearing up versus tearing down. But as far as I know, it's it's going to be eager tearing up and not necessarily collecting type feedback. I actually have a question for you. Okay. Uh, maybe I should have also asked Lynn, but I'm just going to ask you right now. Um, how do you think someone who's like, you know, always written JavaScript and doesn't really have any experience and just came to Electron, Electron was like the world into the native development world. Uh -huh. like, how do you think someone should get started who's like, oh, cool, WebAssembly, clearly there's plenty of benefits. I know nothing. How should these people get started? Yeah, um, I think in a really nice way to get started is with the code labs. So the code labs give you a good idea of 
what are the kinds of things you can compile to WebAssembly? Um, you can always try Rust. Rust is, has a really good story of how to uh, you know, use WebAssembly. Uh, there's also just, every time you're thinking of, uh, you're developing an app, and it's doing something computationally intensive, it's doing something weird or something that you expect should be faster. So um, take like video decoding or something that's computationally intensive and you want to do something about it. So researching what libraries already exist. There's no need to rewrite a bunch of these things, reinvent, that, reinvent all of that in JavaScript. So if this exists in a native code, could you compile it and run it? Like how hard is it going to be? Um, there are, not, there are no easy answers to that. I think a lot of that is just learning because compiling to WebAssembly is easy, but how do you use it in your app? What, how, what makes the best sense? Like what, is, what should your app look like when you compile and include something in WASM? How do you bundle it? Those are maybe not the easiest questions to answer, but it's, it's always getting easier to answer those questions. So, um, you know, the code labs are always a good way to get started, but they're also very narrow. Okay, this is one way you could do it, but there's also many ways you could do it. So, you know, look at the code labs, but also keep an open mind. Okay. Cool. Well, once again, thank you, Deepti. Thank you. Um, he sorry, had a question. Sorry, we had one more question. I didn't see you. I'm so sorry. Was it Radir? Yeah, it was me. Um, could you talk about performance about like from JavaScript to WebAssembly and back? Like what is the what's the cost of the bridge calls, like for example? Is there a concept of a budget, how many calls I can make? Um, yes and no. Like I think uh, we do incur a little bit of a cost when we're going from JavaScript and WebAssembly. Um, but we're at least on the Chrome side, we are working on that to make that interface better. Uh, but again, if you if if you're writing an app that's constantly calling out in and out of WebAssembly and JavaScript, that's maybe not the best use of WebAssembly because what you're looking for is something that's maybe self-contained and doing something intensive. So, um, it, you know, there are ways that interface could be faster, but if, if, there's, if something is doing frequent calls from WASM to JavaScript, that's also, I feel like, maybe a time to rethink exactly what's happening in the app or if WebAssembly is being used for the right reasons. Thank you. Thank you.